Gayana, and welcome to Facing the Nation. I am Alaika Ramsey. Thank you very much for joining us for our program today. Well, the program today promises to be an informative and an interesting one coming up a little later on, hopefully not very late, uh, is I'll have on the program with me today Mr. Carl Greenwich. Of course, as you know, Carl Greenwich is the is a current vice president in the new APNU AFC administration. That's the government of the day. Uh, he's the vice chairman. He's one of the vice, uh, vice chairpersons. And uh, he is also the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I know uh, persons would really want to hear from Mr. Greenwich because lots has been, lots has been happening regarding uh, issues in the foreign sector, the foreign and international sector. Of course, the major one, one which you heard so much from uh, His Excellency President David Greenwich, you heard so much of it from him, and that has to do with the Venezuela claim. Um, we tend to get a little comfortable after so much of it has been ventilated in the media and we tend to fall back and get a little comfortable, of course, as I like to say, until Maduro decides that he's going to wake up in a bad mood again. Um, we don't want Guyana to do that, so I'll be talking to Minister Greenwich on that, how Guyana should prepare in the eventuality of anything. You know, they always say, uh, the older folks always say that prevention is better than cure. So we'll definitely be talking about how Guyanese can learn more about this continued claim by Venezuela and how we can pass on information and teach our children so that they will grow up with this sense of pit patriotism, this sense that this is ours. It's, it's not Venezuela. We didn't take anything from Venezuela. It is a claim by Venezuela. And of course, you will get all the technical details about that from Minister Greenwich when he comes on the program. Apart from that, there are lots of other things happening in that sector, as you know, recently we saw making the news that there were some issues where uh, some diplomats um, who served, who would have served under the PPPC administration, apparently did not uh, want to return home. They didn't understand that, look, their tenure would have expired when the government changed in May 2015. So we'll get to hear all about that from Mr. Greenwich, Minister Greenwich, and exactly what it is that his ministry has in plan um, to and has in the pipeline to ensure that all of those issues are addressed and those problems are solved. In the meantime, before we do that, of course, you know His Excellency Brigadier David Granger, of course, the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. He's been very, very busy. He continues to be busy. And I know many of you miss him from this program, as you know, when it comes to public relations and so forth. Uh, in terms of his political life, he, in a sense, started on this program. So even though I don't have him in person on this program today, uh, during last week, I did an interview with him where he talked about the importance of equality. And this focused mainly on women, uh, ensuring that our women live a better, a healthier, and a fuller life in our society. So basically, he focused on equality. So what I'll do is show you just a part of that interview I did with His Excellency, the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Brigadier David. David Granger, and when we come back, we will be chatting with the Minister of Home Affairs and Vice President, Mr. Carl Greenwich. Stay with us. Hello, Guyana, and welcome to this week's edition of The Public Interest. I am Malika Ramsey. Thank you very much for joining us again this week. Of course, with me is the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, His Excellency Brigadier David Granger. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Malika. This week on The Public Interest, we focus on the importance of gender equality, especially with a focus on women. Sir, your government, I know your government aims to ensure that Guyana becomes a more equal society. Let's first put uh, gender equality into its context. What should that really mean for Guyanese? Well, we started um, on the road to gender equality um, over 40 years ago with the um, state paper on equality for women, which was presented by the government at the time. It is my view that over the years, um, we have not made sufficient, pro we've made a lot of progress, but better could be done to ensure equality. Equality means equality. Um, 
it does not mean um, subordination, it does not mean inequality. It sounds silly, but right now, it is my view that women do not enjoy equal opportunities to males. And we've put it back on the agenda because it is a goal of our administration. Over the next five years, we must achieve greater equality than we have now. I don't know that we'll achieve absolute equality, but it is a firm goal of our administration that we must do more to uh, remove the obstacles that prevent um, women from being uh, treated um, equally to men. Okay. Um, Your Excellency, even before we talk about um, some of the challenges that women may face in terms of achieving uh, equal, in a sense, sort of lifestyle uh, to men, your government has been criticized in the last three or four months for there not being what they want to call enough senior female ministers, without even going into some of the ins and outs of your government. How would you defend that? Well, I don't regard it as an attack. It's a fair criticism. Um, there is not a perfect balance. Um, when we got into the administration, uh, you must bear in mind, first of all, that we are a coalition administration. And uh, the coalition parties, the six coalition parties, have the responsibility to nominate persons who will go into the National Assembly and also who become ministers. So to some extent, we, we have to bear that in mind. In addition to that, we are looking for persons who are qualified. We have several criteria for the nomination of persons to high office. Um, and one of them is competence. Another, I'm not saying that there are no competent women. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking for ethnic uh, spread, we're looking for geographical spread, occupational diversity. There are about six major criteria that we have applied. And in the final analysis, um, we had to select the persons we felt who were most capable, most competent. Um, and I think we did achieve some fair balance. And uh, the next time we get into government in 2020, I am confident that there will be greater progress towards equalization uh, right now, it has not been possible. We did try, and we have to continue working. There are still some obstacles which uh, prevent women from gaining access, which means that the pool from which we had to select also was limited. I hope that over the next five years, um, we could widen that pool so that there are more women from whom we can choose in the regions mm -hmm. and in the National Assembly and in the Cabinet. We're working on it. It's, as I said, uh, although the state paper for equality of women was introduced uh, 39 years ago, we have not um, achieved full equality and we're not uh, um, going to achieve it within the next 39 days. Mm -hmm. We're working on it and I am very confident that by the end of our first tour of office, um, things will be better than they are now. All right, sir. One of the challenges facing women, and we people in society may even say that we have too many uh, single mothers. So obviously, one of the challenges facing our women is the fact that we have a very high level of poverty. I know recently you addressed a conference, a women's conference, and you spoke about government's plans to reduce poverty and, of course, making it a little more comfortable for our women. Let's talk about that for a bit. Poverty is a big problem. Poor people don't have uh, choices, you know, where to send, which school to use, you know, what transport to use, what to eat. Poverty reduces the, the scope and the scale of choices available to a household. And um, from the time I addressed Parliament on the 10th of June, I said that poverty was our, uh, the elimination of extreme poverty was our main concern. Now, if you are to free women from poverty, free anybody from poverty, in my view, the first step will be to ensure that they get a sound education. Right now, there are too many dropouts, and there are too many young women and girls getting children who have dropped out of school. So we have to keep children in school, and uh, we have to make sure that when they leave, they are properly educated so they could find proper employment. That's the second problem, jobs. Um, I have been met by young women in the quarantine and elsewhere who have graduated from the Tain campus at the University of Ghana, but can't get, a, can't get jobs. I go into um, restaurants uh, selling pizzas and hamburgers and other fast foods, and you have people serving there who have CXC subjects um, and are looking for a better job. I'm not saying that there's no dignity in what they're doing, but they prefer to be doing something else. 
And I think our country needs scientists, needs engineers, needs mathematicians who can uh, uh, perhaps perform at a higher level than you know, flipping hamburgers in a, in a restaurant. So we have not, over the past two or three decades, been creating sufficient jobs. And a lot of our young people still choose to migrate to Cayenne, to Suriname, to Venezuela, to Brazil. Um, so one of our strategies is to uh, facilitate micro-enterprise, mm -hmm. to allow women to participate um, more meaningfully in, in the uh, in economy, and, and of course through self-employment so they can sustain their households. And we are examining means to provide them with micro-credit so that they can get enough funds to start up small businesses. We don't have in mind giving people jobs in the government. We have in mind encouraging women, particularly, and men, but particularly women, to um, find jobs for themselves in the economy, producing, selling, distributing, and providing other services. While we're Well, what you got there was just a piece of an interview I did last week with His Excellency, the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Brigadier David Granger. Of course, as you know, that is basically part of the continuation of a program that we will be doing. It's called the Public Interest. I should also um, just warn you to, from this week, beginning this week, this weekend, meaning this evening on NCN, the program will continue. The Public Interest will continue, but it will take a different format. So you can look forward to to that and of course the president that is one of the avenues that the president will continue to use to speak to the public on a weekly if not every week a, a closely together as often as he possibly can as you know he's a very very busy man being a new president and all as i promised earlier i have with me on the program now mr greenwich as you know mr carl greenwich he is a vice president in the new apnu afc administration and he is also the minister of foreign affairs welcome mr carl greenwich thank you very much Malenka. i'm pleased to be able to join you today. All right, great. And it's wonderful to have you. Viewers, I know you would have always, you would have gotten accustomed in the past, accustomed to the fact that I open up the phone lines. I don't do that every week now because I keep saying some of the questions you may have, yes, I may be able to answer them, but I know you would prefer to hear the responses, the answers from our policymakers. So today, it's another treat for you. I will certainly open up the phone lines a little later on in the program, of course, after the minister and I would have had our discussion. So you can feel free to call and pose some of your questions to Minister Greenwich. I know he is well learned. Uh, he has wide knowledge. So there are questions out of his sector that he will be able to answer. But I will urge you if you can possibly stick within the sector that he's currently working in. And of course, that has to do with foreign affairs. First off, let's get to it immediately. Uh, Minister Greenwich, you are known in Guyana as former uh, Minister of Finance, of course, this would have been um, even way before some of us were even able to talk, oh you would have been <laughs> the Minister of Finance in the then, back then, the PNC administration. I'm thinking that persons were expecting now with a new government, especially since you were the shad shadow minister of finance when the APNU was in uh, opposition, persons expected Carl Greenwich to again be the minister of finance. Was it difficult for you to transform from, to move off from finance in a sense to foreign affairs? Well, let me start off by saying to you, Malaika, that um when you are a politician, and most certainly when cabinets are being formed, you prepare yourself for any eventuality. You could be left out completely. <laughs> you could be assigned things in which you have no interest, um, and the like. So one wouldn't get heart failure over a new portfolio, but um, it is true that, yes, I, I certainly did not expect to be assigned something other than um, finance and finance-related issues, planning, and so forth. Having said that, my only work in the past has not been in the area of uh, finance. 
as you know, immediately be before returning to Ghana in 2011, I was, of course, uh, charged with um, leading the technical work in relation to the negotiation of international trade agreements on behalf of CARICOM. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I was in the Netherlands for five years as the head of an agency responsibility of which was information communication management. That is dealing with IT uh, and dealing in terms of substance attached to the IT, the issue of agricultural information, an area that in the past would include all dimensions of extension mm -hmm. um, and research and so forth. When I was Minister of Finance and Planning, I also worked for um, all of that time uh, in relation to both CARICOM and ACP matters. Mm -hmm. So the fora of uh, international relations and um, international development issues are not new to me. Okay, okay. All right. Now, let's move on. When you, and we're going to get into some of the questions and the accusations and so on. When you first took office, one of the issues we had floating around, and it still is a question for concern, because people are wondering what is happening with our diplomats. A statement, uh, of course, this is not a, a, an exact quote, but basically coming from your ministry said that there were diplomats who were serving under the PPPC administration who did not seem very willing to give up their post, their portfolio. What is happening with that situation as we speak? Well, of course, a diplomatic service normally would have two elements. You have career diplomats mm -hmm. and you have um, authors, <laughs> political appointees. Mm -hmm. The story of the Khmer diplomats and their treatment under the PPP is well known. They, um, who are left in the system, are essentially persons who are at headquarters, that is in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And um, for the most part, many of them have either not served abroad at all, and, or they have, um, they have um, been abroad only for short periods. Mm -hmm. And unless some rotation is effected, you have a problem of uh, their experience and their competence and their capacities. That's one side. The other has to do with, as you correctly mentioned, with the um, political appointees. There are a number of such persons in the current diplomatic service. Mm -hmm. And two things perhaps should be mentioned. One is that a number of them left their posts, wherever they were posted, whether it is in Toronto or uh, wherever, mm -hmm. New York, uh, to come to Guyana and elsewhere to carry out campaign work for the PPP government. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I don't, um, I'm not, well, as far as I'm concerned, almost any diplomatic service worth its salt and any public service worth its salt mm -hmm. will not find such behavior acceptable. Okay. There are others who feel that although they are not career diplomats, they've been employed there long, uh, they've got contracts with the PPP government, and they should be able to stay as long as they like, or they should be able to stay out those contracts, serve them out. So let me say, first of all, as regards the very first group, namely those who left their posts, I really have not much patience for that. Mm. Um, and there is, there is uh, as far as I'm concerned, no particular claim on the Treasury as regards their retention. Those that um, have contracts which might have been concluded immediately before the um, the election mm -hmm. would know in having such contracts that when a cabinet when a when a president appoints ambassadors those ambassadors unlike like a, unlike the head of a corporation or unlike 
a permanent assistant secretary or some uh, their chief accountant, they are actually almost specific to the president in the sense that whether it's a Ghan or, 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 or a, one of the normal Caribbean states with a prime minister as opposed to a president, the, the appointment is undertaken of a person who, with whom the, the head of state or head of government is comfortable and through whom messages, mm -hmm. many of them of a sensitive nature, are transmitted to other or the heads of state for which uh, state they, they've, they've got agreement. And therefore, it is very important that the president has confidence in those in that he appoints, mm -hmm. and that they command his confidence, and that when the President of the United States or his Secretary of State receives the ambassador of Ghana, he has to be sure that that ambassador, in conveying messages to him or interpreting a question, uh, has the confidence of the government and the president that he leaves. So, the idea that simply because, although notwithstanding the fact that you're a political appointee and you have a contract which should not have been issued but was issued two days before, before the election, yeah. that you should be kept for that purpose is really not acceptable. And we are not prepared to accept it. What I do wish to say is that when the PPP came to office in 92, they, they gave some persons a matter of days within which to pack up and leave. Uh, this was condemned at the time. We condemn it now. And it is not our intention to repeat the same excess. Oh. What we have said to those officers who have served in this manner is that we will um, apply the foreign service rules. We have rules, and therefore, for those, whether or not their contract was seven years hence or tomorrow, we will give them the normal requirement, there's notice, three months notice, by which to um, pack up and to either be reposted or to resign. Where they are not, of course, um, career diplomats, the question of, um, of reposting doesn't arise. But uh, we will pay for provide the normal arrangements under which their personal possessions, their families and so forth, will be returned um, to Ghana or if they were recruited abroad within, within a three month period. And for almost all of them, that period would, would have ended either at the end of August or sometime during the course of September. Of September, okay. Have, have you gotten, I mean, again, you did say that you would apply the ministry's rules. Um, so I don't know if agreement from them matters or not, but have you gotten a sense of cooperation from them in applying these rules, 100% agreement? Well, some, some, um, some officers uh, were quite professional. They, okay. they wrote, acknowledging the letter. In fact, one wrote, as they all should have done, to say, look, we note the outcome of the elections. There's a new, new uh, president in place, new uh, arrangements in the foreign ministry, and in keeping with practice, we write to inform you that uh, we, uh, we write to off tender our resignation mm -hmm. and to indicate a willingness to serve in whatever capacity you might feel appropriate. We've received uh, at least one such um, response from one of our ambassadors. In the case of some of the others, they're trying to cite contracts that have been issued by the PPP, some of which we have not seen because a number of the contracts were specific to the person. They were not issued by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on behalf of the, on behalf of the president. And so um, they can tell us whatever they wish about the details of the contract, some of them seem to be at variance, extensively at variance with the normal arrangements in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So there are those. Sir, at this point, can you, um, are, are you in a position to say how many ambassadors we have abroad who you, you seem to be having this difficulty with? And you did say that some of them, their contracts will, will, their tenure will basically come to an end before the end of September. 
Well, for all of the for all of the ambassadors, uh, the contracts will come to an end by the end of September, September. latest, uh, and that is how we're interpreting the the our obligations. Okay. Um, in all, there are there are some twenty heads of missions, which would include consuls general, mm -hmm. uh, ambassadors, and high commissioners. The honorary consuls are really a different category, and um, no, I don't really want to. Uh, perhaps um, isolate for special attention the the numbers. Okay. Um, just let's say, you know, we, we don't have a, a very large core of, of heads of mission because we are a small country and a number of the external missions have been closed. So mm -hmm. it is, it is uh, somewhere in the region of 20. I know our country, we're a country of uh, brilliant people and we have lots of resources, especially human resources um, hanging around. Will we be in a position to efficiently replace these people when their tenures come to an end, or will we be scrambling to take somebody from here or there? Do we have those persons in Guyana who can fill those positions uh, when their tenure really comes to an end? Well, you you have people within and out of the country on whom we can draw. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, and and let me not speak about the people outside the ministry because you you don't even know if some of them want to one would oh, like really? to work yeah, with us. But uh, within the ministry, you have um, a number of young persons, as I indicated, mostly inexperienced, simply because they haven't been given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So one of our first tasks is whatever you may have done with the head of the mission, you move some of the young ones into positions um, in the missions so that they can start to build the experience yeah. dealing with... Um, uh, whether it is in the multilateral fora or whether it is at a bilateral level, whether it is uh, learning the technical and political uh, avenues and nuances or the language, because that is also a very important part. A good part of the communication has to do with language, and that is an area in which you have to do a lot of work mm -hmm. to get persons in the ministry working on behalf of the ministry with capacities ranging from Dutch, which of course, is all, is non practically non-existent in the ministry, non-existent, not practically, to um, Spanish, Portuguese, mm -hmm. French, and so forth. We have to we have to build those capacities. Minister one of our biggest neighbors, of course, not immediate neighbors, but one of the members of CARICOM, is Haiti, and uh, French seems to have disappeared from our curricula. Minister, it's, it's interesting that you would say that because now I'm I'm thinking, but. In terms of the capacity that you should have to work in the Foreign Affairs Ministry, shouldn't these, what you're talking about, shouldn't it have come naturally? What what went wrong? How, how did that happen? Why do we have a foreign ministry where people are not capable enough to function properly in the Foreign Service? Well, because the Foreign Service, I'm afraid, was viewed by the PPP, at least when it became, when it took office in 1992, as some place that was elitist. Indeed, this is the term that uh, Rohi and I believe Dr. Jagan himself used, that this was an elitist place. And they came to fix that, um, to fix that elitism um, and to dumb it down, I'm, I'm, I'm uh. sorry to say. So you've had that effect. There was also a very marked racial dimension here, the, the belief that... Um, the recruitment of persons on the basis of merit. You, Foreign Affairs had traditionally tried to find the best of the best. So you will, you will find that in the past, uh, Foreign Affairs would have recruited uh, a large number of persons who were Ghana scholars um, and, and who would have had outstanding academic achievements, brilliant linguists, uh, outstanding in their own field. Some of them are mathematicians, some chemists here, lawyers there. And um, this was regarded somehow as undesirable and perhaps too, too uh, elitist and exclusive, ex ex exclusive. And so they seem to have uh, not put much store by those values. And at the same time, in managing the system, you simply took a man, for example, who was a PPP, mm -hmm. the head of a PPP 
party, um, uh, party group, group. Mm -hmm. in London or in Toronto, and you made them ambassador, and you've leave, left them forever. So we've had some appointments that have been something of an embarrassment abroad okay. in terms of inability to deal with uh, what was before them and a lack of confidence by other diplomats in them. So that's the other. And thirdly, the lack of rotation of officers, okay. where you have a large number of officers who are not moved. The, the top ambassador or the high commissioner doesn't move much. And therefore, underneath, you get stagnation. People immediately below the ambassador leave. Those underneath may, may, may be promoted, but they're not promoted out into the system to come back in and train, uh, train the others and develop the others. And this can have a very deleterious effect on the morale and capacity of a diplomatic service. That has been the case in Guyana. Okay, and sir. you would have re recalled that when there was a complaint born of the um, allegation in the book by uh, Freddie Kisun that um, the government was operating in a manner that suggested that it's racist, whether you call it ideologically racist, I don't know what that means, but that the, the, there was a clear unwillingness and an, a refusal to appoint uh, non-Indian ambassadors, and certainly uh, those of African stock, Dr. Luncheon made a now famous or infamous statement about, uh, about Guyanese of African uh, descent not having the capacity mm. to meet the requirements of the foreign ministry. Yes. This is being said by the representative of a government which inherited a foreign ministry that was I wouldn't say exclusively, but uh, the bulk, perhaps more than half of it, was uh, uh, comprised people of, uh, of, African, of African stock. Because this is where people, people aspired to go and therefore the best went there. Okay. Within a few months of that, when Mr. Ramatar came to office, of course, some were appointed, I think, simply to deal with the embarrassment caused by, uh, by Dr. Luncheon's statement. But that's the reality in which we live, in which uh, racism is, is, uh, goes under all sorts of names. And the very, the very agencies that have perpetrated this and defended that behavior now accuse others who try to fix it of, uh, of um, um, ethnic cleansing and all sorts of things. Okay, understood. Minister, let's now move on to Venezuela. I am concerned that when, and I, I used this, this term earlier to describe the entire situation, Maduro is apparently quiet now, for now, when it comes to Guyana. And I'm concerned that when he wakes up, he decides one morning that he gets up and he's in a bad mood again, he's going to try to come after Guyana and this uh, claim. What is happening now with the Venezuela claim and what measures, as there seem to be quiet, and sometimes Guyanese tend to forget that we have an issue that we should also, we should always remember to focus on the fact that Venezuela continues to claim our land. What is happening with government now in terms of addressing that and are we making preparations in the event that Maduro goes into a bad mood again? Well, I don't think it, um, I don't think it um, accurate to suggest that President Maduro is uh, perhaps not continuing whatever he was doing two weeks ago or four weeks ago with Guyana. Mm -hmm. What has happened is that the extremely aggressive, abrasive statements being made in relation to Guyana have now also been made in relation to Colombia. And in mm. the Colombian case, the armed forces have acted to expel Colombians from, uh, from Venezuelan territory. For the moment, as regards the press, <laughs> Guyana is no, perhaps no longer on the radar for the press, yes. but not for not Venezuela. Really. Up to last week, Venezuela sent officials to a meeting in, uh, in Latin America, where the representative read a statement about Guyana. Uh, up to a week ago, Venezuelans were traveling the Caribbean, Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs, suggesting that the biggest heist of, 
of land that have, had ever taken place, the biggest heist of, uh, of oil that had ever taken place, had been perpetrated against Venezuela by Guyanese, uh, by Guyana, with the assistance of multilateral corporations. Um, and this is an ongoing um, initiative by Venezuela. It is something with which we have to be constantly vigilant. And whilst the newspapers may not carry a story every day, it we is. have work to do every day. And that work involves being vigilant and countering, anticipating and countering these uh, unneighborly uh, claims by Venezuela. Just to remind the public uh, of the situation, how serious can Venezuela's claim to Guyana's lands get? Well, it, it, it has been very serious and perhaps the most uh, extreme behavior on the part of Venezuela in, in connection with uh, Guyana's territory has been the occupation of one half of Ancoco. Mm -hmm. Ancoco lies in the Coyuna River, which is shared, which is at that point, that island is shared by the two countries in which Venezuela has one half and we the other. And Venezuela has occupied the entire island by dint of force. Mm -hmm. And as regards the maritime space, whilst the, the convention of the law of the sea has set out rules by which countries with a coast can have an exclusive economic zone, territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, and what is called the extra continental shelf. It's, and it set out the rules for dealing with disputes arising. Venezuela, without an Atlantic coast, wakes up one morning and seeks to pass a decree saying that this Atlantic coast belongs to, to them. And um, that is as serious as it could get, even, even though that particular claim now led to Venezuela in effect seeking to annex the exclusive economic zones of almost all the territories that form part of that Eastern Caribbean uh, arc range running from, uh, from St. Kitts all the way down to Grenada mm -hmm. and around to Cayenne and um, Suriname. Okay. Viewers, what I'll do now is open up the phone lines. You can call and pose your possible questions to Mr. Ka Minister Carl Greenwich, and of course he is willing to take your calls. You know the rules, turn the volumes of your television sets down, be as brief as you possibly can, and of course get to the point. Again, I know Minister Greenwich is capable of answering questions from almost any sector because he's been a very main component of the current administration, and even before the current administration took office, but I would really appreciate it if you can try your best to stick within the Foreign Service, the Foreign Affairs Ministry, and so on, that sector. Caller, welcome. Are you there? Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to yes, you. Yes, I want to ask Mr. Carl Bunny, if, um, if the PPP was still in administration, do you think the Venezuelan would have reacted like this towards Guyana and this oil fine? Okay. Thank you, caller. Minister? Very simple answer. The answer, caller, is yes. The Venezuelans have acted even more extremely with the PPP in office. Let me just remind you that in 2013, mm -hmm. the PPP was in office. In 2013, the Venezuelans sent a frigate to seize a vessel doing survey work for Andarco. And the story that the Venezuelans tell about Guyana, Mr. Granger, and ExxonMobil is completely false. It is a figment because the most extreme action Venezuela has undertaken in recent times in the maritime zone has been undertaken when a PPP administration was in place at the time when Venezuela was on good terms apparently with the PPP administration where the minister and ministers could claim to have personal friends uh, in the Maduro cabinet and yet that frigate seized the Techniques Perdana and dragged it out of the, uh, the, um, the exclusive economic zone of Guyana, if not out of its own territorial sea. So there's a very simple answer, yes. yes. Okay. There's no magic with the PPP. 
before we go go back to the phone lines, Minister Greenwich, uh, you you did talk about it. It happened at a time when um, Venezuela would have supposedly been on good to, good terms with the then um, government. Is there a consequence now? Because there's the issue of the rice deal closing in, in terms of coming to an end, and then there were reports too also that Guyana may soon, may soon be in a position to take oil from Trinidad instead of Venezuela. Is all of this happening because of this claim? Well, the, the, the um, claim has existed since 1962. But notwithstanding the claim, Venezuela has sold oil to Guyana. Guyana has bought oil and paid them for it. And we have had a, an opportunity to sell rice to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So the claim itself does not uh, negate the opportunity for bilateral cooperation. And the, the UN makes this point all the time. In fact, the minister of the, the foreign minister of Venezuela writes and never fails to say that uh, they would like to continue uh, cooperation and discussions on um, bilateral matters. However, you know that uh, one of the oldest techniques in the book is to be smiling and patting someone on the back yeah. whilst you are stabbing them in the in back. The back yes. And um, this is the dual track followed by Venezuela. Whilst both uh, um, Mr. Chavez and, uh, and uh, Mr. Maduro were speaking to Ghan in, ca in, in case the day after a visit by the Venezuelan president to, Ga to Guyana, you had parliamentarians and civil society um, elements um, crossing our border mm -hmm. and seeking to um, lay claim to Guyana and establishing, or if you like, the claim that uh, has no particular uh, basis. And you had Venezuelan troops entering Guyanese territory, blowing up um, mining, mining equipment, two dredges, and in one case, killing a Guyanese. So I don't know whether there is something those who perhaps um, uh, see uh, magic in names see, but I don't see it. The, the greatest excesses committed by Venezuela against Guyana uh, have not or don't change with the party in office. Okay. They invaded Ancoco before the PPP came to office. They blew up equipment, killed Guyanese, even as the PPP were in office, and seized vessels even as the PPP were in office. Okay. So having the PPP is no protection against Venezuela. Okay. Carl, are you there? Yes, I Good day, Mr. Gunet. I'm happy to know that you're here. Okay. I'm calling because this is concerning the social department, but I don't get to speak to the minister. Mm -hmm. But after you said that Mr. Gunet is all around, mm -hmm. I can speak to him. Okay. Concerning the, uh, the public assistance, uh -huh. does it have anything to do with pension? Public assistance? Yes. Okay. If you used to be given public assistance, and then after you get to the, the, the pension age, they will stay that way. Okay. And then now again, and I think they used to give the social assistance, they give classes and all these kind of things. Now pensioners got to go pay $10,000 at, at Nova Scotia Bank. Mm -hmm. It used to happen, but I don't know if it's stopped now. All right, caller. Listen for a response from the minister, all right? Yeah. All right, then. Thank you, minister. Thank you very much, caller. And I, I hope that I, I find you well. The, the two areas, public assistance and the pension arrangements, are, in a way, of course, linked. They have to do with ensuring that our citizens who attain a certain age can uh, be supported by the general system so that they are not, um, they are not de destitute or impoverished. Mm -hmm. uh, the cabinet has at various times to make a decision as to whether it is going to give more to pensions 
and to pensioners than to public assistance. And that will vary from year to year. It will vary from cabinet to cabinet. Um, we have, in the past, um, paid attention to raising public assistance levels because we recognized they were very low. At this point in time, however, the minister and the cabinet had decided to give priority to pensions. And uh, be, remember that this is a budget which is actually now going to be implemented in the ninth month. Okay. Mm -hmm. And therefore, don't treat it as the end of the road. In other words, as though this is what is going to happen for the rest of the tenure of the APNU AFC administration. Uh, early in the, the at, well, at the end of this year, or very early next year, there will be the 2016 budget. It's not going to be a budget at the end of the first quarter. It's going to be the, a budget at the beginning of the third quarter. Okay. At that point, the minister will have an opportunity to revisit again those vulnerable communities in Guyana and see what it is he can do to assist them. Okay. Again, the cabinet may, will reflect on this, and you can use the opportunity that you might have between now and then to raise the matter Hello. with my colleagues. Sure, will do. Caller, you're on the air. Thank yes, you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, actually, Mr. Greenwich, I like, I was watching your CT um, or RGZ when you spoke to, uh, I think it was a diplomat from Venezuela. I mean, that was really good because a lot of questions you asked him on the program, I mean, concerning the whole or the claim and everything, I mean, he's going to answer, but I just want to know, is it because the country we found oil, that's why they actually want to uh, like the sea now, because they're talking about the, the one on land, so I just want to know. Um, <laughs> that's, that's your question, caller? Yeah. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Listen yeah. for your response. Caller, thank you very much. Well, I, I'm... I'm pleased to know that you found the uh, previous program uh, in, informative. As regards the Venezuelan claim, the Venezuelan claim did not occur simply because oil has been found. The claim predated the, uh, the discovery or confirmation that early indications of oil are there. When Guyana was approaching its independence in 1962, the Venezuelans uh, were, were um, driven, what, how shall I put it? The Venezuelans were prevailed on, let me say, to seek to lay claim to Guyana's territory. And the question of whether it was simply a ploy to stop Guyana becoming independent or more is for the historians to say. But my own interpretation is that the intention was to try and force the government's hand that is the British government's hand at the time to, in order to protect Guyana from the possibility of a, a, a Venezuelan invasion, to come to some agreement mm -hmm. to give the Venezuelans land in the hope that uh, they, will, um, they will leave Guyana to develop peacefully. The problem for Venezuela, which Venezuela doesn't seem to understand, is this. If Venezuela, together with Britain and the United States, agreed on a border, on Guyana's border and Venezuela's border. And Venezuela helped to mark out the border, so much so that certain points on the border where it would have been helpful for the, the border to run along recognizable geographical contours, they refused. In those circumstances, when you are then accept that portion of the territory given to you. Why do you believe that the other parties will regard you as trustworthy? In other words, when a decision is made to share something, it is shared, you eat your part, and then you come back and say, well, you know, this is 50 years ago, I now want more. Why should we believe, why would anybody accept that if they were to give you more, you will be satisfied with that? So this is really where the problem lies. It is a question of trust. And if a country cannot respect an international treaty that they signed, that they committed themselves before they signed to honoring, then what 
Is it that that country can do to persuade the other side of its goodwill? Very little. Okay. Except to stop making the claim. Okay. Caller, welcome. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I, I am as a Guyanese. I do know some history about it. And I have to remind us, even though we live in America, America is a signatory to that treaty, and they also supported Venezuela in the time with Fox Burner. Mm -hmm. For the same reasons why they're trying to get rid of that government over there. And it wasn't that government in power at the time. And this started since, like you said, since 62, when we were about to get independent. So no one can be trusted in these things, really. So I just want us to keep that in mind. Okay. Right? Because we are fought as African people in this world all the time because the world is set on fascism. Fascism was not defeated in 1945 only against Europeans but not against Africans because it has continued even in America. And we do have a problem coming up to settle with them on reparations for a fact and we don't take care of our situation. All right, caller. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, that was more of a comment than a question. and I. I, I not not sure that there's something for the minister to respond to there. Well, well, let me let me let me do let me let me say that yes, the U.S. was a signatory to the to the 1899 arbitral award, and it was in fact the United States that forced the United Kingdom uh, into the discussions in 1895, and it is the U.S. like the United Kingdom that agreed with Venezuela on the borders. Mm -hmm. um, what they did subsequently is another matter, but the. The caller is right in the sense that every country looks after its national interest. Mm -hmm. And we would be rather foolish to sit and think that, well, because uh, in 1899, uh, a country supported us in, in, uh, in 2009, they will be doing the same thing. The national interests vary. Guyanese of all people tend not to, not to appreciate this and speak of countries as though they 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 are Our somehow um, morals and their values are are immutable over time. <laughs> um, yes, so it is interesting that Venezuela, which benefited from U.S. intervention in uh, in 1895, should be now calling U.S. companies imperialist, calling the U.S. imperialist. It's the same company if country if it were not for the United States. Venezuela would not today have the mouth of the Orinoco River, one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in the world. This is what was taken from Guyana and given to Venezuela. So Venezuela regards, or at least Maduro regards the U.S. as, as uh, today an imperialist, but it wasn't an imperialist when he took away <laughs> Guyana's land and gave it to the Venezuela. Well, well, he didn't take it away. When it facilitated uh, the arbitration tribunal, the tribunal, took that land and gave it to Venezuela together with pieces of the of the western banks of the Orinoco River. Okay. Caller, are you there? Yes, I'm here. It's me again. Hello. I'm not satisfied with the, how the question was asked. So. You asked Didn't the... I asked about the, the, the... I was asking, if I used to get the public assistance, I read the pension aid, if there's a state that we and, and, and don't give it to public citizens. And give you the pension only? And only get pension. And then I was, I was talking about the glasses. I hear nothing about the glasses. All right, caller. Right? Okay. okay. Let me see if the, the, the minister, he did answer, but minister, I don't know if you could. Well, well, the, the, the caller is right as regards the, the benefits. And I'm saying to him that if he believes those uh, current arrangements need to be changed, he has some time for the next budget. The, the current arrangement didn't stop res people who got public assistance from getting from, from, from pension, pensioners from getting public assistance. That is an old arrangement. And uh, the arrangement as regards glasses was provided not under the public assistance arrangement, if I remember correctly, but as part of the NIS arrangement. Uh -huh. um, some of these need to be looked at, I agree. Um, you can't look at, at them all at once. And I'm su just suggesting part of the process of, of government has to do with the public pressing Press. the government, drawing to the government's attention. Right. I think this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you raise it. You raise it on a radio, a talking 
call-in program like this, you raise it in public meetings, you raise it in your party groups. If you're not in a party, you find right. the opportunity the, when the, the president is speaking to raise it. The, some That's, of the, many of the ministries yeah. got, has an open day yeah. when people can go and see the minister. So really and truly, Minister Greenwich is right. You have an opportunity to even help yourself because and, and, and every minister says it. And it, it really is a fact. Government alone can't do it. We need the public's assistant. Or at Call least the ministers alone. The ministers yes. themselves <laughs> uh, have different priorities and, and so forth. And some of you, we're already mm. trying to find a way to clone many of you. <laughs> Caller, welcome. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, I'd like to raise some issue concerning the Venezuela board. Could you speak up a bit for us, please? I'm concerning the Venezuela board. Yes. Hello? Yes, caller, go ahead. Yes. So, what I'm saying is that I. Um, a kind of person who likes to follow about it. So what I look at is that from the time we have been in um, this country has taken a viral part. I am Caller, I yes, doubt the minister. The minister is not hearing you. You have to speak a little louder for us. Independent, right? Uh -huh. I feel this country has taken a downward spiral in terms that everybody just think that when the British were here, nobody was trying this kind of stuff. Now, oh. everybody, so now I'm coming for peace, Venezuela get peace. So if we get into Venezuela, so now I'm going to take the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So currently, at the end of the day, we can left with a little land and charge them alone. Mm -hmm. So I think I don't, I, my greatest suggestion is that I thought that Guyana should just give back to Venezuela because the different governments <laughs> or countries are going down. Thank you, caller. Yes, it was more of a comment, and I know Minister Greenwich is not going to agree with that, and I don't agree with you either. But Minister, I, and it's not. It's I, I'm not sure I heard him, I, I, and I really don't believe don't I heard believe a guy that he say, said that. say that uh, we should not have been independent. Um, the point is that if you if you want a partner, if you want a partner, it's just as as though you want a wife. You can't just decide yourself that you will have that partner. The partner has to have a say in it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no reason to, to believe that the British want uh, colonies in, 20, mm -hmm. you know, in the 20th century, let alone in the 21st century. You have a right to be independent, and you have a right to protect your independence yourself. Nobody else is going to do it for you. Okay. There's no silver bullet here. All right. At this time, we're almost out of time, but because my phone lines are really, really going, I'm go just going to squeeze one last caller. Caller, welcome, and please be brief for me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You, you and Minister. Yes. Yes, Anna, there are four River Bridge. Yes. Um, is there a possibility that the government can resuscitate the areas as early as possible? Okay. Some those people's style. Okay. As well as people. Okay. Because we have, um, we still have the Malali, the Tirani, and the Makora just knocking around. Okay. Can they just research this repair those two telling? All right. And Ca just carry on those boats, touch and go quickly. Caller, thank you very much. Uh, Minister Greenwich is a member of the cabinet, so I know that he can respond to this fully, but I'd just like to urge you and, and, and put you on your guard to expect some statements. Um, uh, within the hour, it, some of the statements are probably all there already. The Minister of State, Minister Harmon, had the post-cabinet press briefing this morning, and he addressed the issue in its entirety, but I know Minister Greenwich can uh, give a possible comment on the issue. Minister. Well, uh, it, is not my, it is not in my portfolio, and certainly... Uh, if, if um, the minister responsible for this would be largely between the Ministry of Finance mm -hmm. and the Minister of Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But the, the answer to the question is yes. Of course, we do have arrangements, and the agreement, neither the agreement nor the law, stops the government from allowing a ferry service to operate. Okay. And uh, I'm sure that they will look at all the options, sure, yeah. including the uh, the use of uh, the river as a means of transport. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, Minister Greenwich. I mean, we can go on. I didn't even get to touch on some of the other things that I wanted to touch on, but of course, we only had one hour. Uh, viewers, I see you're still calling. Unfortunately, the program has come to an end. I can't take any more of your calls. Minister Carl Greenwich, of course, Minister Greenwich is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He's also the Vice President in the still relatively new APNU AFC government. Thank you very much for coming, sir.
Thank you very much, Malaika. It is my pleasure. Okay, great. Viewers, until next week, I am Malaika Ramsey, thanking you for tuning in. Of course, look forward to that issue about the Barbies Bridge being ventilated today and throughout the weekend It's in, in its entirety. Also, look out for the public interest, which takes a new format from this evening that's going to be aired on NCN television at 7 p.m., of course, that's where you get to hear much more from the President, His Excellency, Brigadier David Granger. Until next week, I am Malik Ramsey. Thank you very much. Be good, Guyanese citizens. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And, of course, join me again next time. Goodbye.